And hello everyone, here we are again. So Saturday, our fifth Artist Open Studios and hopefully we're live streaming. I will be watching and hopefully Sophie, if you can also watch me, that would be perfect and answer any questions that we might have on um, Facebook on the live stream. But welcome Richard and Tracy. Hi there. So today we're doing a double hander. This is exciting. I haven't done this before. We're going to try a tour going to do back to back and because it's Saturday and why wouldn't you do that we're going to just go and we're just going to like as always as pure always says we just have to take action and we just got to see how it goes and I'm sure I'm really excited because I think this is you're both so dynamic and it's so colorful I think this is going to be absolutely brilliant and as Nadine says she can see us all, which is brilliant. I'm really <laughs> glad you can see us all. It's really good <laughs> news. An echo. Is there a bit of an echo on your headphones? If anyone else has got an echo, let me know. I haven't got an echo. I don't know whether Richard is, Richard's fine. He uh, hasn't got an echo fine. either. So it might just be your... Tracy's got Barbie headphones on today. It's the she's Barbie cut, nemesis. She's That's doing this. She's doing the... She's being a Barbie girl today in her pink headphones so um it might just <laughs> be daughter. it might just be your alter alter ego barbie <laughs> no echo no echo on the other end so that's great so i'm sorry um tracy but barbie is obviously whispering in your ear while we're chatting it's like being in barbarella or something <laughs> oh where's uh -oh. the orgasmus gone <laughs> Hopefully it all come good. I hope for your sake it all comes good. So here we are again. So down, as always, down in the bottom, you can see read the Art360 magazine here. So there's all the artists who are exhibiting with us in Art360 in the magazine link. And when you're we're live streaming onto Facebook, if Sophie can put the link to the magazine in the comments, that would be great. Everyone can have a look there. And we regularly post where everyone can read the magazine um, on the website. And I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to pop Tracy and Richard just down into the corner for a minute. And I'm going to share the magazine and I'm going to show you Richard and Tracy's pages in the magazine. So don't be offended, guys. I'll bring you back Come in on. a minute. Don't take it personally. <laughs> but focus the screen on me. Then I'm going to share the magazine with everyone. And we're going to go Art360 Magazine, share. So as we arrive, we actually arrived straight on to Richard's page. So you can see here that we have Richard's page, first of all. And Richard is on page 83. I said just I'm really going to have to get those glasses out, aren't I? Because um, it's tiny typing. Um, so Richard's on page 83 and you can see all of Richard's contact details there. And you've got his email to start off with and then his website, etc. And I'm going to quickly show you Richard's website as well. So let me just turn that off and I'm going to share the screen with Richard's website so you can see that as well. So share. So this is Richard's website and that's what it clicks through to. As you can see, you've got home and then all his amazing pictures. And I just found out earlier uh, all his sculptural past, which is really interesting. So we'll talk a bit about that when we're doing um, the segment with Richard. And then we go back onto the magazine. So we're going to come off of Richard's website and we'll have a look about that a bit more um, when I'm chatting to Richard. And we're going to go back onto the magazine and this time I'm going to take you on to Tracy's page. So as you know, how you do it is you look through, find the person you want to go to and you click on their link and look at that like magic. It takes you straight through to their page. So again, Tracy is, um, she goes across mediums. She does ceramics and she does painting. I'm sure she can tell us all about that when we do, we speak to Tracy and I'm going to be speaking to Tracy shortly. And then, I'll also quickly show you Tracy's website. So there's lots of flipping about on the screens here, but it's worth it just so you know when you arrive on the right pages that it's familiar. So this is Tracy's website, and that's all about Tracy there. And then her homepage, which is very colourful. 
again, um, and lots of all different media, so sculpture, ceramics, painting. Oh, we've even got some um, textiles here as well. So super cool. So yeah, we'll have a little bit more of a look about that when we've got when we're chatting to Tracy. But that's where you can find everybody. So to start with today, I'm going to chat to Tracy. Now I'm really oh thank goodness for that. So I've unmuted Tracy. I'm hearing Tracy and back up on the screen. Hi, Tracy. And we're going to just have a little chat with Tracy about everything to do with how you got started, how your practice evolved, etc. If you can like tell us where all of this started, that would be absolutely brilliant. And then just, yeah, take us on your journey of how you got to where you are today, because I am absolutely fascinated. Tracy's new to me. I I've only met Tracy once before, and that's when we did the practice. So I am fascinated. I think you, I've been watching you in Greece, doing all your painting in Greece. And I did say to Tracy, if she arrives here with a suntan, I was going to be very cross. I do think there's a little bit of a suntan going on there. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, it's washing away. <laughs> but yeah, please tell us where it all began for Tracy and how you've evolved and how you ended up where you are today. Oh, blimey. <laughs> well, um, you can I've tell been, you're a Kent girl. <laughs> forever. Over 30 years. So over 30 can years. You? We can hear you. I've got a terrible echo, so I can hear myself three times. So I wonder if I, if I mute myself and I've muted Richard, you can take your headphones off and let's see whether it's better without your headphones. And then if you, yeah, just take us on a journey. Unplug your headphones. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. We can hear you okay, absolutely cool. fine. So I think that's fine. You can do it without your headphones, which I think yeah. as your Barbie headphones were causing you quite a lot of distress. <laughs> You're my daughter. <laughs> Don't worry. And right. Yeah, so it'd be really interesting because I know that's like when you are on the mobile phone, isn't it? And you can hear yourself twice. It's really, really um, disconcerting. It's quite disorientating. Yeah. So yeah, tell us where it all began. You've been an artist for over thirty years, and I know you're a Kent girl, so like yep. my like myself. And uh, when you say "cool blimey," I was like, "Yes, she's a Kent girl." <laughs> <laughs> well, I like coloring in, and I like my dog. And um, so that's when it started. I can still hear the echo, but never mind. And then I didn't really think about doing art apart from colouring in until my friend Jo went to uh, um, O level. Or was she doing her A level? This was, this was in Upper Sixth on my fourth secondary school. So I hadn't exactly failed at all the subjects. In fact, I did beautiful drawings in my A-level biology class. But it wasn't until I did the art that I really thought, wow, this is, this is um, something I want to do. And I followed my friend Jo to um, Foundation. She was a year ahead of me at uh, Maidstone. And that was a huge influence on me, really, with the drawing. I learned how to draw there. My tutor was Arthur Neal. Hi, Arthur, if you're watching, probably not, but um, he was a huge influence. He really knows how to draw, um, how to paint, and I took it very seriously. Um, I didn't know, there was no background to make me think about um, going to do a degree or university. I didn't know how to fill the forms in or what the protocol was. It wasn't in my, my family. Um, so really, again, I followed my friend. I put Bath down, and oh, no, I put Newcastle down, choice. They didn't like me, and I put Bath down a second, um, they didn't like me. 
I always made very uh, personal work and I gave them my sketchbooks and they were going to look at the work and then I said, oh, but the sketchbooks are really intimate. And they said, do you not want us to look at them? I said, no, no, it's okay. And actually, that doesn't really change because my work is still intimate and I still have that feeling of not being sure whether I want people to really look at it or not and certainly whether I want them to buy it or not. Um, so I studied painting for three years and of course I covered um, pre-baking and sculpture. There was a ceramic studio there but I never entertained that. And then the next step was, I got a 2-1, the next that was to do an MA. I applied to Chelsea, they didn't want me. And one of the teachers said, put um, Birmingham down as a second choice. So I went to Birmingham and I hadn't gone out of Kent apart from going to Bath and then I was going to Birmingham. And they were really impressed by my work ethic. And I arrived with massive things that carried on the train, uh, they gave me a scholarship. So those are the days when you used to get money. And although it was a kind of not a trendy art school, I saw every single student I wanted to see. Um, but I still didn't really know what I was doing. So I did that. And I went to London. That's what everyone did. Um, and then I had a bit of a breakdown. I mean, I had started going to counselling when I was 18. But I went to do a counselling course and an art therapy course while I was studying. And then I began to understand my work and realise after all this nonsense in my head for years of trying to work out my work was about, it was just really about me. And I wish I'd known that earlier. And I wish I'd valued that earlier. Um, I was very uh, articulate and interested in people, interested in talking to people. So I got thrown about a lot and I didn't really focus. Anyway, I did that. Then I did some traveling. Um, didn't didn't really have a model of what I was supposed to do next. I trailed around everywhere with my work, trying to get it into exhibitions. Sometimes I was successful. I exhibited with Tracy Evans, um, claim to fame, and um, but I didn't really. I wasn't clear about my direction. I started working as a hospital place specialist and then I got quite ill mental health wise again. Overwhelmed really. I was working in a high dependency unit with children who were dying. And then I went to Greece. And well, you can say the rest of the history really. Um, I lived, I ended up living. No, I need to go back a bit. I went on a donkey trek, and this, and all my friends would be going, "Oh my God, my story again! Oh my God!" But basically, my I'm sorry, I'm still getting the echo, so it's a bit difficult. It's fine, Tracy. the The sound is but, quite difficult to hear. So okay. um, I think it's because your tethering is like not robust, but we can hear you sufficiently that we can hear the story. And I, I just keep going, just keep going. And we can hear you sufficiently that um, it's fine. And okay. everyone is aware that there is a bit of a sound problem, but we can hear you enough that it's, it's so engaging. What you're, the way you're telling your story is so engaging. I'm fascinated and I don't want you to stop. So yeah, just keep going. Okay. It takes resilience, but just keep going. I've got resilience. Okay, so this beautiful man, a beautiful horse, came galloping down the middle of the road on this white stallion, 
with a long mane and tail, and he had black curly hair, black eyes. There were bees flying off the horse, and I was completely overwhelmed. Never seen anything like this in Peckham, which was Wales at the time. And I went on the donkey check, and he tried to seduce me like he did all the girls. And I wanted to somehow prove that I wasn't a summer romance. So I went to live with him on this mountain in a hut. And at the time, back in England, um, I'd been referred to the Morsley Hospital, and they were thinking about a for my mental health. Um, I was having a complete sort of breakdown. Um, and what that looked like is I was only able to eat the same thing every day. I wasn't able to socialize. I cried all the time. I had what I would, I described as existential loneliness, completely overwhelmed by everything. And not, and actually I felt quite emotional saying about it even though god we, we feel quite I feel quite emotional listening to you how old were you at this point um so i was in my late 20s yeah and uh, it's a significant time for all of us isn't it as we come to that we come out of those teenage years and it's all exciting and all of a sudden the hormones kick in and reality of life kind of kicks in and you have that existential moment it's like actually what is this all about? So, yeah, I think lots of us, that will resonate with lots of people, have it hitting that moment at that time in your life. Yeah. I was in a sublet council flat. Everyone had left. It was flooded. I had no friends. No one knew what to do with me. And my, I even looked for my doctor and my therapist at the same time. I don't know. Everything went wrong. So. I went to live with a shepherd in his hut on this mountain in Lesbos. And it had no running water, no electricity, literally a breeze block up over the milk and shed the sheep. And although he is a real redneck, rough character, um, I felt completely safe. And I found it sounds really cheesy. But I had wilderness therapy before there was such a thing. Um, and I really found myself. I found that the mountain was like a breast, a maternal breast that was nurturing me. The nature was phenomenal. The animals were my friends. When I was a child, I'm getting emotional again. I wanted to be like the babe in the woods with all the animals. And somehow in my 30s, during this breakdown, I manifest this experience for myself, which is quite amazing. And I made drawings um, during this time of the animals. Um, occasionally, Costa will come back. He was a shepherd and a horse dealer. But mainly I ran the farm on my own. And, a kid, and his father would turn up every morning to feed the pigs and he would whistle outside the hut and he would give me the orange and the pea pie that his wife had packed in for his snack. And I had sheep's milk, eggs, cheese pie, orange, and occasionally Costa would come back in the middle of the night. I would also have a fire going. That was my own uh, lecture and so I had to go further and further to collect wood he would come back um, usually full of uzo feeling happy and he'd bring this really sweet bitch wine and what and the lamb chop from the slaughter and we'd throw them on the poles and I'd get up from my little camp bed it's about two foot too short and I bite into these delicious lamb chops and I could taste the blood and the cold and the sweet red wine. Anyway, I got very fit chasing sheep and I really found my own strength without any doctor 
doctors, education. Um, I suppose it could have gone the other way, but um, it was a really formative experience. And I still know him. We're friends. And that's why I've now got this house in Lesbos. Uh, that makes sense now, why you've been in Greece for the... And do you think you can see all of that journey and all of the experiences you have then? Is that that's what we're seeing in all this wonderful work that we can see around you in your studio now? Well, this, this drawing up here behind me... Do you want to try actually... moving your headphones on again? Just give that one more go to see whether that just creates okay. better sound for those listening, because... Your story is so amazing, Tracy. I don't want to miss any single moment of it. Okay. Let's try that. The drawing up here, this uh, pastoral drawing, is like, well, it's a rather glamorous version of a little dwelling that's on a shepherd's farm. And sitting and drawing that now just made me really happy. And this time, when I went to Greece, I really wanted to embed myself in the environment. And the best way for me to do that was to draw it. So, yeah, that's amazing. But you've been working yeah, that on experience. A... Yeah, sorry. Sorry, yeah, you carry on. That experience. Yeah, that experience was really formative because jumping on since then i did um a master's in art therapy so i'm a qualified art therapist and it was then on that course that i started to do ceramics um and you've got a piece of ceramic that you've been working on today right behind you haven't you that'd be lovely if yeah. we could have a look at that yeah it kind of relates because it's a cowboy <laughs> the start of a cowboy and I, I was sort of I sound cheesy I've been my own hero and um, so although it's male it's kind of me at the same time all of we, my work is kind of me at the same time we have to be our own heroes I think that's you know one of those things that um we I was talking to my husband about this today. I was like, although, you know, I'm there for the family, I have to be selfish sometimes because if I'm happy and I'm in alignment with myself and i am got my boundaries, then I know everyone else, I'll be giving the best I can to everyone else. So it's important that you are your own hero. So talk us through what you're doing there or how that might look when you're working through that piece. Well, I haven't done any clay work since before I went away, so at least for six weeks. And I had that feeling again of not knowing what I was doing, which I love. A lot of people, when I'm teaching art, or I talk to them about art, they're, they're, they're fearful because they, they say they don't know what they're doing. I love not knowing what I'm doing. It's the best. Um, so I just use my imagination, really. I think what it feels like to be inside the body or I think about the physiognomy of a boot or a face or a horse or I've been looking out for 55 years, just turned 55. So I know what things look like and I know what things feel like. I've ridden horses and so I just feel my way and make the work. And is that, this, is that the same for your paintings? Do you feel your way through the paintings as well? I do. Um, but I, that's something I wanted to talk about, actually. Because I work from my unconscious. So I don't know before I start what I'm going to make, necessarily. And then it just comes. And I trust that process in any media. So I've made big 
sculpture installations in the woods. That was before I went away. Not to show anybody or anything, just because I need to make them. And I was thrilled when I went back because someone or lots of people have started making other things. So it's starting to look like a sculpture park in the woods. Um, that's super cool. That's super cool, isn't it? When we see that we've we've inspired other people, and I know when I'm looking around your studio, I can see that you've got lots of like found objects and li like little artifacts, like the the little um, plaque on the right hand side here with the cowbell. Uh, I be do you collect like things like that to kind of like help your unconscious mind just give it cues as to where you're going? Yeah, I'm a big collector of stuff. I mean, in Greece. Those are sheep bells, but I collect bones. So I've made lots of work with skulls, um, sheep skulls, and I wanted to make a sculpture garden in my house in Greece, in the garden. So I've dragged, literally dragged olive trees off of the shore. Um, all sorts of things and I'm making a film as well so I've been filming out in the environment how do you how do you find all that technology because I know you know me? yeah we can hear you um it's slightly better now you've got the headphones on it's not breaking up so <laughs> much so that is that is actually an improvement I know it's awkward for you but actually it is an improvement I mean we're learning every day with this technology and you know we knew that because you're not doing it off of a Wi-Fi link that is the tethering, that there could be some issues. But we, as I say, your story is so fascinating and so evocative. You know, we just have to keep going because it, it's such an important story to tell that, you know, it doesn't matter where you begin. It doesn't, you know, the journeys twist and, and turn. You, you leave it out to the universe. You let it manifest itself and you will be where you need to be. You will get where you need to be and where you are meant to be. I'm a great believer in then there's lots, you know, this tiny degree between um, this like bit of consciousness and there's lots of stuff going on there. And it's the thing you grab and you grabbed the stuff about doing something in the woods. And at that time, you grabbed the thing about living in Greece for a while and it works for you. I'm quite happy now. I'm quite happy being an artist. Were you and I'm were, quite were you, in my process? Were you not happy in the beginning then? Because that begs the question, doesn't it? You say you're happy now. I've been very tortured <laughs> by my mental health. I'm laughing about it, but it's taken me a long time to understand myself. Yeah. I think Nadine and I were talking about this yesterday, self-awareness. You know, once you become aware of yourself and aware of what could, how you could react and how, you know, the, the old stuff that comes up and that could be yours or it could be your parents or your, you know, stuff you've inherited in terms of your mental health, um, how you behave. And once you become aware of that, then that gives you the choices, doesn't it? I choose happy. I have to be honest. I mean, I've been, my story I'm exactly the same age as you. I have a very similar story to tell of mental health issues over the over the years. But I choose happy. That's what I choose now. I choose the option of I'm not going to be upset if something doesn't quite go how I wanted it to. Bend like a tree. Be quite Japanese about it. Bend like a tree. I choose happy. And you can see that in your work. It's so colourful. It's so full of life. I mean, immediately it came through. As I say, I mean, there's so many artists in Art360 that I don't know personally. But I, um, you know, as soon as your work arrived, um, I was like, wow, this person's got a story to tell. There's something really, you know, it was leaping out of the page with the story to tell. And uh, uh, yes, thank you. Choosing how we wish to feel and behave and how we wish to behave is so empowering. And I love that, that you are now happy. Yeah, not all the time. No, well, that wouldn't be real, would it? You can't be happy 24-7, but, but you I, know, I you still can study. I've found um, a lot of peace through studying. 
Me so too. That's how, that's how I've understood my mental health. Yeah, me too. Isn't that bizarre? Same year of birth and me too. I found a lot no, of... Do you know any Greek shepherds? I, do you know what? <laughs> this is a really funny story. But I don't know how old you were saying. You were about 20 odd, weren't you? Um, yeah, I was actually pro I was actually proposed to by a Greek boy called Costa when I was twenty two. Wow. and he and he and I said no. I turned him down, and he was going to come to England and find me. And I was like, no, no, please don't do that. I was terrified because <laughs> I'd been to Greece on holiday and met this boy called Costa. And oh yeah, he wanted to marry me, and I was like, no, that's I'm not ready for that kind of thing. So isn't that funny? Oh, as soon as you said Costa, I was like, I had, a, I was born the same year, had the same kind of set of mental health issues. It's amazing how the universe works like that. And I had a boy called Costa in my. So that just goes to show we're all living along the same line. It just depends which bit we decide to grab, doesn't it? There was more than one Costa. <laughs> there was Costa number one, Costa number two. Richard, I'm so sorry you're having to ensure the cost of stories. <laughs> many, many, I'm sure everyone's got some cost of stories, but yeah, it is. Cost um, number one. Cost which packet one we called it? Cost of packet. Did you, you, so do you have, um, you have, I know you have a daughter now, or is it a sister? Yeah. Your daughter. Yeah, I have a daughter, Beatrice Rose. And um, so you have, a, you have a family. Yep. She's 10. Yep. And my, yes, and my youngest is 13. Very similar kind of you know, like life journeys. It's uh, it's interesting to hear. I had her um, late. Yeah. She's just a miracle. She's a miracle. Oh, <laughs> bless. And, and, and you're wearing her headphones? She's with her pony today. So do you ever bring that yeah. into your art as well, the family life that you have now? Does that ever kind of appear? Because as you say, it's all about you. Your art is all about you. Do you bring that into your art? What, my family? Yeah. So Yes. Yeah, I think particularly in my plates, you can see them. Yeah, my plates are very much directly from my conscious and their dramas quite often. And obviously my family's involved in my dramas. Bless them. So I think it'd be really good. I mean, that's a really good prompt, Annie. Thank you. I think it'd be really good to have a quick like look through, talk us through some of your website, because this is where people need to go if they're interested in buying your work, viewing more work. Can um, I just say something? Yes, go. The website is a little bit out of date. It looks amazing. Thank you. It's, it's I mean, like I an art piece in itself. I work in lots of different media, so there's lots on there. Mm, but well, let's let's get it weeks, up. Yeah. In two weeks, um, my web person is going to create a portfolio for my place because people wait for my place, mm. so. I need a platform for them on their own. Okay, but will there be a link from this existing platform to this new plates platform? Yes, it'll be on the website. Perfect. Because and I, all my works on my Instagram page. Okay, so we'll be able to see that as well. In the Art360 magazine, all of your contact details are there. So that's brilliant. So let's yeah, yeah, yeah let's bring your website up and so we can have a look at the plates that you're mentioning, because I think they are and they're incredible. And I'm not surprised that people wait for them. So let me screen share your it's website. So yeah. Wow. So we're going to bring your, yeah. Show us that again, Tracy. Show us the plate. I just pulled out some of my favorites. Well, before we go on the website, let's just have a look at those. Yeah. Show us through the plates that you've got a selection. And just talk us through. Talk us through them before we go to the website, because that'd be great. They're very um, green. I like this one because it's really lyrical it looks like it was easily done but any artist will know that to draw in a way that looks really easy isn't easy sort of hard one thank you arthur neil for teaching me to draw um and i like this one too 
all my work is about relationships and I try to get as close as I can to the intimacy. So this is really special to me. Um, Beautiful. So what we'll do now is we'll share your web. Yeah, you're still there. Don't worry. So we'll share your okay. website now. So there we go. Look at that. Absolutely astonishing. So I'm going to put that up as the script. So the whole screen. So we'll be able to see the whole screen. So we're down the bottom now, as you can see, and this is up on the screen. So this is your portfolio. This is on your I think this is on your home page, isn't it? This is the yeah. home page. And then you, so I'll scroll through. The variety of work is just in, astonishing, Tracy. Yeah, I work and a lot. What's the chair? So is that is that an embroidery, a, a tapestry? It's an applique ah. piece. I made a series of work called Floral Armour. There we are. You can see that. Yeah. Throne of Truth. Yeah, photographed by Peter Ritzer. He came to my studio. So I don't know that person at all. So Peter. Peter Ritson. Okay, he's quite a well-known photographer in the area where you are. Is he uh, well-known yeah. to lots of people? I think just in this area. Mm. Really I beautiful. I don't know where he works. So, so that's, the, that's the chair. And then if we go on to portfolio, and we'll have a look at your ceramics. So this is the aspect of your website that you're going to now create a unique part for the ceramics or just the plates. Whatever I feel like. <laughs> totally selfish. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. And so you should be. So you should be. It's your work. I worked you... hard for this liberty. Yeah. Be true hell. Yeah. You can, can do, do whatever, whatever you want. Whatever you want. They're astonishing. They are as you say, so lyrical, such a, an amazing narrative running through them. Look at that one. I think I'm going to have to put myself on your list. Of, okay. I, need, I need a plate. I definitely, I love these ones that have got the really, really detailed drawings on. So let's have a look at that one yeah. in more detail. I love making them. This is me. I set up an art school in um, my village in Vatusa in Lesbos. So this is a breastplate. So that's me teaching. Uh huh. So that's what that one is there. That's a breastplate. And if we go back, let's see what we've got. We're going back and we go through the plates, and we've got some more of. Yeah, this is this is an interesting one now. Definitely. So talk us through that one. What's that one all about? Which one? Oh, that one. That was one of my first pieces. The paint plate was made by Carol Foster. She teaches ceramics in Whitstable, Whitstable mm -hmm. Potteries. And so she made the plate and I did the painting. So it was a collaboration. Do you generally now make the ceramics yourself or is it generally a collaboration that you're built by existing? Because they're all amazing shapes, I've noticed. They're not like sh plate shapes, are they? They're all different shapes, your plates. No, they're porcelain or they're all porcelain they're all handmade by you not all by me mm. sometimes you... i can't because i'm so prolific mm -hmm. and i might once i find a seam of cre creativity mm -hmm. i might want to work on 30 or 40 pieces mm -hmm. i can't keep up with myself so i have somebody who makes porcelain plates for me in a handmade way and when she can't do them i do them fabulous and that's great isn't it it's a collaboration that comes together really beautifully so this is an early one and that's and that's a very yes. traditional as we say round shape but now they're all very um, unusual shapes which i again i absolutely love because that's just life isn't it we're all unusual shapes there's no right or wrong and also i respond to the shape yeah. so i've got some here Right, so so I've, got, got a a really, I've got a really little plate. Wow, look at that. It's got a little sort of Greek scene. 
I'm sorry, that one's got an erection on it. <laughs> Randomly. <Hey>, <laughs> um we, no, we, we, didn't put, we didn't put out a, a, a disclaimer at the beginning. Um, you didn't warn me that might be anything that might be offensive to some. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. There's no children watching. Yeah, I'm joking. We do always say these aren't made for children. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Carol's just said your freedom is inspiring and refreshing. And I absolutely agree. You know, like responding to life, responding to the shape of the plate. So, uh, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, Tracy and what I'll do now is I think we'll move on to Richard because I think the okay. two of you it's so beautifully side by side you know with this multi faceted art practices and then we'll come um we'll go we'll have a chat with Richard and if you've got questions Tracy for Richard and Richard if yeah. you've got questions for Tracy do put them in the ask a question area at the bottom and then when we've had a good old chat to, to Richard I'll come back with all of us on the screen and we can ask everybody's questions so everybody who's watching if you've got questions please do uh, put them in the ask a question area and anyone watching us on um, the live stream on Facebook pop them in the questions on there and hopefully Sophie might spot them and if you can Sophie pop them back over onto Crowdcast for me that'd be brilliant so Tracy we're going to just mute the mic as they say for a bit and we're going to bring um we're going to bring Richard up on screen so yeah we'll be back with you shortly okay. thanks so, thanks very much so we mute the mic we're, unmute the mic for Richard bring Richard back up on screen so hi Richard thank Hello. you for your resilience and and patience of waiting down there quietly in the corner <laughs> <laughs> so that's that so interesting that was fascinating, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. So you you've had a sneaky peek on how this works now. Mm -hmm. so the, yeah. floor, the floor is yours. It'd be really interesting because I know your journey um, is. You know, we're all of a similar age group, aren't we? We've all you know yes. we've all got a journey um, <clears throat> that I think is really important to share with the audience because when people buy a painting or a piece of sculpture from any of you artists, they are buying that piece plus the previous 35 odd years life well 50 up to 50 years um life they're buying all of that as well and i think it's lovely for you to share that so you know people really understand what's gone in to create <laughs> that one piece where, so, where i'm coming from yeah. yeah tell us where that all started um gosh well i was born in the pennines um and grew up on a farm uh, just north of the Peak District on um, the Pennine Way, and a little place called Saddleworth, which is a, just the westernmost piece of Yorkshire that sort of pops over the Pennines into Greater Manchester. So it was as always this sort of a little place, collection of villages, and then as you're getting more and more up into the hills, farms, and then the farms would be on the edge of the moorland. Um, uh, so it was a, it was kind of on the edge of uh, wildness where we lived and my dad farmed. Um, yeah, so that landscape has informed me and, and made me sort of in my bones, in my marrow. You know? um, and it's, it's, it was touching listening to Tracy's story about, about sort of issues of mental health and creativity and how creativity can um, really save one you know, one's practice becomes one's best friend and a lifeline at certain times. And I'll come back to that. Um, but my mother had a breakdown when um, I was about six years old and she developed a sort of a, a split personality and, and heard voices and, and various things. And my father was very hard working and worked incredibly hard to keep his family together, to, to stop my mother being institutionalised, which was a very unusual situation living in this beautiful place with a very very um, bizarre and eccentric <laughs> kind of home lifestyle um, um yeah so it was very very changeable from day to day and it wasn't really until I, now and this time i'm 56 now and i look back on my life and i kind of think of the the difficulties of that childhood and the trauma the traumas that we all went through but also the great gifts that, that came along with it. Um, I'm intrigued mother, if, now. You said your mother had a split personality. Who was she? 
Um, well, I don't really want to go there, but, oh, just, but just to say, you know, if if I'd been arguing with my sister Susan, I've got an older sister, two yeah. and a half years older than me, and we'd be at it, you know, hammer and tongs, I see, and I then we'd be upset, you know, maybe tears, and then my mother would just sort of do cartwheels across the room, you know, to kind, of, to kind of break, to bring joy, you know. Um, that's just incredible, it. isn't it? <laughs> well, it's sort of, yeah, there's this that's a ability As you say, to, that's a gift. to really upset everybody, but then be absolutely hilarious. Um, and I would go on a walk and I'd just sort of say to my mum, you know, can, you, can I have a cricket? You know, and we'd be walking through the meadow and she'd, you know, somewhere in the process of this walk, she'd catch a cricket for me. So wow. I'd, I'd have a cricket in my hands and listening to this cricket. Um, I've got envelopes full of four-leaf clovers that she collected for me. She could just sit, sit down in the field and there'd be a four-leaf clover. I mean, I tried, <laughs> but I haven't got the neck to catch crickets or find four-leaf clovers. But, you know, I, it was a wonderful kind of, um, uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful memories. I'm being born and raised in a Pennine, uh, uh, in a valley. Um, it was very nice, it's sort of a liminal place because, you know, Saddleworth Moor is sadly infamous for the Moor's murders. And those, those sort of children were left just a few miles from our farm. So always when I was growing up, there was this great fear or sense of threat, but also the beauty of the Moor, the changing seasons, the intensity of, you know, the going, helping my dad find sheep and pulling them out of snowdrifts. So, you know, it was sort of, it was a real elemental experience. Um, but getting back to sort of this mental well-being and creativity, I think by the, when I was making my um, public sculpture for, for, for Barrett Holmes that we were talking about before we came on, um, you know, I was working, I hired a, a barn and I was working in a local, a local village in Ashes Wood. And I had these great sort of um, eight metre oak, uh, oak trunks delivered. And I was working on um, with, with chainsaws and, and carving, direct carving, those things. But I was working in a farm environment that I felt incredibly, I, I, I knew the environment. I knew I could use the environment. And the way that the, the way that, that work um, came to fruition that made me think of my father and his working on a farm. And the practical sense that I have can, comes from him. But the imaginative sense that I have comes very much from this world of my mother. So the in, internal, external, external kind of archetypes of, of mother and father were very strange for me, but they still gave me a great strength. And, and that comes through in my work to this day. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it, how our parents have this massive influence on us. But as you say, you know, you've got, you've got the both sides there. You've got that amazing environment that you grew up in both mm. externally on the moor and then and which you can see in this amazing work that's behind you but you also this amazing internal dialogue and narrative that's created by the people that brought you up yeah. that is equally you can see um coming out in your work so you were saying about that um the sculptural piece that you made for barrett holmes so we we just briefly touched on this because i said um before we came on air i said i love the fact that the universe randomly delivered me Tracy and Richard to do this on a Saturday because, as I said, we just I just lucky dipped it out of a hat. And I said, as soon as I saw the work, I was like, these two people, you know, they're they're so the same and so different. And there's definitely I've always thought with Richard's work this sculptural quality. And I said this to him, and he went, yeah, because well, I did sculpture. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that about Richard. And uh, and I was fascinated about the fact that there was this sculpt sculptural um, element to your practice but you very much now work in this 2d medium don't you um yeah i've been working really for the last seven years um following on from uh, gerhard richter's big retrospective at the tate modern in london i i went along to the show thinking gosh you know this is gonna be i'm gonna really love this this is sort of painting and sort of figurative photographic kind of elements to the work and these large color abstractions that he's famous for um but the, actually, after about 12 or 13 rooms of these paintings, I began to feel quite sick. <laughs> and I sort of went out, had a breath of air, and got myself a cup of tea. And then I went back in, um, um, and then I went back to the room, um, the paintings that, that are called the cage paintings, which uh, the tape bought from him. And I looked at this work, and I thought, no, it's, 
it's like a wall of, of oil paint. It's got no transparency. It's got, it's got no breath, you know? And I think I understand a lot more about Richter and Richter's where he's coming from now, from reading and studying since that time. But basically I said, right, I, you know, I'm going to go home. I'm going to get some printmaking equipment and make some paintings that breathe with transparency and, and beautiful, beautiful color. Um, and I think for an Englishman, it's quite easy to say that because it, there aren't the same strictures on our, we can be lyrical and romantic, whereas I don't think you can in Germany, you know, because of what happened with, yeah, romanticism led to uh, mm. certain things in the national yeah. socialism, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But Richter is, is dancing on that edge of, of what's, what's possible and, and what's, yeah, what's pertinent and what can we make today. And for me, I think I'm not, I'm not a Richter, I'm not sort of an international, I'm not, I don't have to speak to an international stage. What I do, I follow my interest in what I do. Um, but I was also deeply influenced by the work of Ian McKeever, which I found, the first painting I saw was one of his temple paintings in the Royal Academy in about 2007. I went in, I think it was, a, it was a early in the week, early morning, and I went in, it was a grey, grey day. Um, and it was the year that was the Ron Kitai retrospective in the first two or three rooms. Um, and I went to see the Kitai, but actually I completely forgot about him because there was this Ian McKeever painting in the distance that came off the wall to meet me. And I walked straight up nose to nose to this painting, trying to understand, what is this? What am I seeing? How, how is this painting in the front, in the front space? So the notion or, or the experience of frontality in painting came about through that direct experience. Um, so when I'm making a painting, I'm actually trying to create that, that sense of, uh, yes, the kind of depth of colour, but also to have colour that we can project into the space. So the notion of presence becomes, um, yeah, making a unique painting which can stand in the space with you and which can change and grow with you as your understanding changes and grows. So that notion of making a piece of art that is mirrors where I am in, in the moment, in this moment of my life. But also it's something that I'm not, I'm not making something for myself. I'm working, I'm painting, and I'm trying to make a painting that can stand on its own, that makes sense. Um, I mean, a few years ago, I was making pieces. This is a, uh, a piece that I made called Fire on the Moors. It's when the Moors in Saddleworth caught fire. And, um, yeah, I was struck by the firemen going up there to, to beat the flames and how, how courageous they were. So I'm working in a way which is quite figurative. You know, it's a landscape, it's got blue sky and it's got dark peaty moors on fire sort, sort of thing. Um, but I discovered something else. I don't have this painting. I don't know if you can see that. Presence in colour. Stunning. Yeah, yeah, so that's really just a, well. a print of the, of the original. But um, you can see, if you take a moment to look at the, the reds in the painting and then to look at the blue, the quality of blue, the reds have come about through the transparent magenta being drawn over yellows, different yellows. So maybe Indian yellow and Hansa yellow light. And when you look at the painting, does the blue come forward or retreat? Um, there's elements of it for me that come forward and elements of it that retreat depending on which way you're angling it on the screen to be fair so yeah, there are yeah. some that I could go yeah. into and then there's others that are kind of coming through to me as a like a 3d same with yeah. the red there's kind of a there's almost like a portal within the red so, that you can like portal through and then there's yeah. others that are like really kind of coming through as a like a 3d I don't know about whether anyone else is seeing that as well and so it's not the best way to show it, but just no, to show but it's it, like really, yeah. I mean, we can see it very clearly. The blue is a luster color rather than blue as depth. You, know, mm. you can play; one can play with that mm. in terms of the color space. That's what I'm trying to show you. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's what I love about your work. It's like you know, there's there's so many nuances to it, and you mm. use squid. I saw earlier in the. Um, when you were Sorry. doing, that's all right. <laughs> Things are fall, falling on me as I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, well, you, in, your, in your preview, yeah, you were doing the, the squeegees. It'd be really interesting if you talk us through that, pro your process and how you do it. Well, 
um, there's a whole yeah, a variety of ways of, of, of putting the paint down, but one of the things I'm using is just a perspex squeegee, transparent perspex squeegee with a, with a small handle. Um, and a whole variety, and the larger ones I haven't brought home because they're up in the, in the studio. But I also use silicon tools and brushes and um, palette knives and, and maybe sometimes a piece of wood or a piece of card. Um, and everything depends on everything else in painting. Um, and it depends, uh, every uh, surface will affect the way that the paint is taken up. Um, I don't know if I can sort of show this in a way, but this is a piece I made from my, not the current series, but the, the series from last year, which I called um, Folded Light. And this is on a piece of plywood you can see, and that has a surface which I've prepared, a gessoed surface with a roller. And that has a certain, um, certain tooth. Can you see the texture in this colour here? Absolutely, yeah. So that will take colour in, in a particular way. And then if you're working with a, with a canvas, the canvas is very different because it, it has a, a flexible surface. Yeah. And therefore, you can't you can't build texture on as you can with a with a hard surface because it won't the canvas moves and, and it takes the color in a different way in a, in a different sort of dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, but this is make, making something with very liquid color. I think you can see there's lots of wonderful little bubbles in that mm -hmm. that sort of rich uh, milky uh, zinc white. Um, do you put a ground on first? So do you put a color on a color ground on first, uh, or do you do go straight onto the white canvas? I, because I know you just the board. Um, yeah, just I mean you have to because of the the acidity of the wood. Yeah. So you have to you have to seal that. But with something like the um, the painting behind me, um, I think that that started life as a. Um, Sort of this kind of colour. So it was um, as an orange and that orange and Indian yellow, that kind of quality. Yeah. So underneath most things, there, there is a ground of colour. Um, and that can be a wonderful way of, of starting the conversation because you can then, you know, have a sense of if I have a, a, a light, bright orange ground, then I'm going to make a blue painting on top of that. And that um, Contrast will inform the blue in a way. Um, and you work in acrylics. Changes. You work in acrylics essentially. Um, I do. I, I love oil paint, um, mm. but I'm I'm been working in acrylics more more much more than oils. Although I have oils around me as well. Mm. Um, yeah. Talk us through this blue piece because I, I, that's really capturing my imagination. This the, one. the the long piece here next to the bright coloured one. So this long, yeah, you've got, and the and the one with these three as well. I mean, you've been doing a series yeah. in lockdown. I saw that you said you've made something like fifty pieces of work in lockdown. It's getting on for sort of sixty, more or less sixty wow. finished paintings, and a lot of others still in process. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that that was interesting to be to find myself, you know, everything stopped, and I was walking up to college, going through the fields, crossing the medway walking up through the crops that were just, just appearing then and the green, the trees were just coming into leaf. And so it was this kind of a magical time. All my classes stopped. So I cleared the studio and I just went in and suddenly there was this sort of space of time and space to dream and space to make. And things just started pouring through, which was a wonderful time. Yeah, so um, the blue, well, the first painting that I made was um, started life as I was teaching, I was working with the students, I had a class of about six people. And some people, there's an art therapist who comes, he just, she just wants me to start her off and then she's off, you know, so I'm, so I'm not teaching um, a kind of beginner's class in the sense These people are very, very competent and, and can just run with it. And I'm working alongside them in that way. So this started, started life as a piece that I was making with my my students and it was bright yellow and teal um, and as the as it progressed it became darker and darker and as we got into this covid and this sort of lockdown the sense of the 
we're not quite sure what's going to happen, but something terrible has happened. You know, this whole kind of build up and that sense of dread that came about it. I made a painting that was predominantly red and then almost deep purple and then with a bright sort of magenta. And I, I describe it as quite an angry painting. And after, it was quite a surprise to me to find something so, um, yeah, so aggressive and so wrathful as this kind of fiery red painting. So the blue painting came about as a kind of, not an, not an antidote, but, but just, just to find, you know, something calmer and something in, in, in a different part of the, the colour wheel, if you will. Um, and the other paintings beside it, I discovered that I love zinc white and I love this sort of slightly transparent quality of zinc white. Um, and you can play with zinc white and titanium white to create wonderful um, sense of translucency in other colours. Um, so I started to play with that. The bottom painting is um, zinc white with green gold and a red violet and probably a little bit of uh, a deeper royal purple. Um, and the one above uh, was setting up this very, very deep maroon and then running um, the zinc white into that maroon um, and getting this wonderful sort of, it's probably got a bit of glazing of violet over the white once the white had uh, calmed down and dried. Um, yeah, um, I find and, the, and the top and the top one to so the very top one. Um, yeah, that has got. A, I don't know if you can how it's coming across on screen, but it's got quite a warm ground. So it's a it's a azo orange kind of. It's almost like a, a chestnuty brown with, with, with an orangey brown with cool teal and a pale fallow green over the top of that. Um, so working with you know. Um, warm and cool colours to create, uh, to float the teal over the, over the warm earth tones. Really. As this painting behind me has got that, that quality also of blues over, over on the warmer ground. So do you have an aspiration for that work now? Do you have an idea of what, what you'd like to happen with the, you know, you've got these I would, look, I would I would like them to be exhibited, but you know, How's that going to happen? <laughs> so I can, I can, I can do something wonderful online. We're discovering lots of new ways to do things. Yeah. As, as yeah, yeah. So there's lots of ways um, to yeah. explain that work. Um, I think going forward, it's just you know thinking all of these things are double edged, and you know they with all of our life experiences, we you know something amazing. If we look around the corner, what is it? What is it we're trying to learn? Yeah. What is it we're trying? So I find that so exciting. That you've got yeah. this body of work now. What well, it can go. I mean, I can I can create you know an online experience that people can go and look at the work, and you know that that's something mm. which is in process. But mm. I can also apply to various galleries, and would you be interested in showing this work? You know, that's yeah, the traditional of way of doing it. Um, mm. Yeah. So because galleries watch, are open. watch this space. Yes, yeah, they are. Open. Yeah. Yeah. and I know our galleries are open and um, we were at the gallery yesterday doing an outside broadcast was a new challenge and sound has been a bit of a problem this week but we're okay we're, get, we're getting through it I think there's a lot more people on the internet again so um, you know that's that's also bringing another dynamic to it I see that we've lost Tracy completely to our oh. <laughs> to our little community here so I think um her connection obviously was a bit of a problem today, but hopefully she might she might reappear back in a minute. But I thought what we'll do now is we'll just again we'll just have a look at your website. And well, actually, my 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 I've got a new website that's coming online in about I think a, a week on Tuesday it will be You've up with a shop. With Tracy, haven't you? Yes, exactly. Well, no, it's a whole new website. Um, wow. The, the current website, I, I it's it's actually got quite old, and I haven't been able to upload much of the new work. Mm. Uh, without the whole thing collapsing <laughs> and yeah. everything disappearing but it's just on the edge of, of functioning so it's time to time to I, change but I, it hasn't, I, I was hoping we could we could get it up for now for this event but my uh, the current web host designer was away on holiday last month so it hasn't, wasn't possible to do that's always the way isn't it and i often feel like i might collapse if people try and upload anything more to me <laughs> i feel for your website this is like <laughs> overload yeah. information overload <laughs> image overload yeah. well we'll have a quick look at what you've got there because will the web address be the same 
It will, yes. Yeah. So when they Richard at Richard Ian Haynes .co .uk. So when they go to the same um, address, they'll still see. They'll just see the new site. So it will pop up there in, in about a week's time, yes. Yeah. So I mean, even so, I mean you still you can still see paintings, works on paper and sculpture yep. here. Yep. And yeah. um, you know, as we know, you you're saying are you still doing the exhibition at uh, Mr. Gallery in Eden Bridge? Um, I spoke to spoke to Dan uh, last week and he's his I'm not quite sure if it will be the end of October. I'm not quite sure how his how he's starting, but he's planning to start again. I haven't got the details of that. Right, so the so dates might slip a little bit. But yeah. I know affordables, they are hoping to do them in November, but I'm not sure whether right. that's actually... They're not, it, they're, it's, it's cancelled now. Um, it, but what's going to happen is my gallery, uh, Clifton Fine Art, they're going to have an affordable art fair show in Bristol. So I, I'll right. have some of that work in, in Bristol, uh, I think, at the end of November. Oh, that's, that's great isn't it and harrogate yeah. as well um that is in for 2021 so uh yeah. hopefully that one might go ahead so these on your paintings gallery um yeah you've got a um oh look there's one with the white on as well stolen time so is that that's a relatively new new the little i think what i put on the first page they're all small pieces that yeah. um, on paper so they're they're the, this this scale Right. You can see that, and there's twenty. There's maybe twenty-five in that in the series of this scale. Mm -hmm. mm. They're lovely. So they're on the shelves just to the right here. On the yes. Uh, and what kind of price point are you looking at for that kind of size of work? Hundred pounds. Hundred pounds for these. Yeah, it's supposed to jump. Well, um, if plus postage. Plus postage and <laughs> Yeah, get in the plus postage packet. Um, so if people are interested in that, they can just email you, presumably. Yes, or, yes. Uh, you, have, you have social media, you have Instagram and Facebook as well. Everything's there, yes. Everything's in the magazine. So yeah. if anyone is wanting to contact you, go to the um, read page on our website, look in the magazine and all uh, Richard's contact details there. I think they're absolute gems, those little ones. Um, and that's awesome. pounds. Hundred pounds plus postage you're packing. It's a slip. Come on, it's you an know? absolute steal, Richard. <laughs> you have six, couldn't you? And make a really <laughs> lovely big cool. you know, yes. kind of like installation of Richard's uh, work there. So we've got some questions. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether Tracy comes back. If we've got questions for Tracy, um, so I'm going to come up and share the screen with you now. Um, and hello, I'm, I'm back. Oh. So. <laughs> We've got some questions. So, Richard, the first one is for Richard, fortunately, because if we have some for Tracy, we might have to wait and see whether she does come back. Um, this is from Marie, Maria Turner. Richard's colour choices create so much atmosphere. Does he pre-select palettes or is it a more intuitive process during the development of the painting? Yeah, definitely the latter. Um, I think, it, you know, as I said, with the with the blue painting, it came about after this sort of this angry red experience. Um, I, I try not to not to sort of start with thinking um, uh, because that sort of puts manacles on me in a way. Um, so I want the colour to speak. And, and of course, then when you start out, you're in this vulnerable place of uncertainty. But then wonderful things happen. <laughs> and one of the one of the things I was going to say about the colour is that when you work with a squeegee, um, you know what you completely cover what's there or partially cover what's already there with another layer of color and then you're sort of scratching that back to reveal color that's underneath and you can't you could say you could be really clever and have a sort of approach well if i use a particular kind of yellow in a particular way and then i draw color on top of it and then i scratch it all off something will happen so you can have a kind of plan Actually, you can't plan for it because it's an accident. You know, you're actually provoking accidents and chaos, but you're kind of, you know, you have an intention to that. And I know that if I put a viscous yellow beneath several layers of colour and scratch back, something of the yellow will shine out. But I can't, you know, I can't guarantee how that will happen. So there is a lot of, of sort of knowledge. And there's also a lot of, a lot of sense of, you know, uh, the pull of the squeegee and what tension there is in the colour. Is, is the colour dry? Is the colour wet? And that wonderful kind of play 
it's an elemental thing. It's a sort of you're feeling the substance and you're playing with colour and you're playing with your technical knowledge of surfaces and things. That is quite a comprehensive answer, Maria. So hopefully, I think the answer essentially is it's intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> it's all technique. It's all technique. <laughs> There's no pre-selection. So how does teaching impact on your creativity, Richard, and how has lockdown affected this? That's from Louisa. Well, what a good question. Um, um, you know, teaching stopped, of course, with lockdown. And I met, that meant I, I cleared the studio, cleared the tables, and I had my personal studio back. Well, hey, now what can I do? You know, and I, and I found that I was ready for that space. Um, teaching is something that is um, very challenging and inspiring and wonderful and terrible, you know, because you can have very positive experiences and you can have, you know, don't get on with everybody who comes to the studio. So you have to sort of you know, negotiate the human realm in teaching. And when you're painting, you're, you're doing something very internal and very different. But um, painting in necessity, by necessity is a sort of isolated thing and you can spend too long on your own. So it's wonderful to meet people and have people come in and um, have, be inspired by what you're saying or take up certain ideas. And then, you know, I'm seeing some of the people who've been to my classes on, on social media who are creating beautiful paintings using using silicon painting tools and things like this. And that's 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 very rewarding, a phenomenal thing. So it's like balance, isn't it? It's like a balance. You need to achieve a balance between teaching and personal time in your studio. Yeah, I think that thing of personal time, I, there's something about, about pr privacy that is essential for the creative process. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't be, you know, you can't be too, you could be very self-indulgent, I think. You know, that's the danger. So having students keeps you real. You know? Yeah, it gives you another perspective. Yeah. Different perspectives. Yeah. Perspectives. So, uh, does Richard frame his pictures? That's from Fran. Do you frame them, and do you frame them yourself? I suppose is the answer. Is the question there? Yeah, basically yes, I do. You frame them. Yourself. Don't look, don't look too closely at the drawing. <laughs> no, I've got I've got a lot of kit that, that I, I do that. Um, I think it, that's just it's just about you know if I've got sixty paintings to to frame, I can't afford to go to a framer to do that for me because. Um, yeah, just you'd have thousands of pounds locked up in framing. Whereas I can get some moulding and some tray frames, and and um, you know join that myself. Um, it, it's actually yes, if you quite easy. Show us on the back. Can you show us on the back how you what that looked like in the back? Yeah, so there you are. You 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 haven't kind of got the whole back covered. It's just dropped the yeah. canvas into the tray frame. Hmm. Four screws. But also, impressive. I mean, there's so many different ways to frame things. Uh, I, I really like the, this is quite an elegant thing. So you have a piece of wood and then you just, you just hang that on the wall, a piece of plywood. So you get the, you get the detail of the ply. Um, that's something yeah, very, ni very, very nice about that. You know? I've got some that are framed, uh, that have got that, uh, was it split, split? Split button. Split button, thank you. Yeah. Split button um, system, and I really like that because it's like you know, something very. It's almost like closing that like really nice clunky door, isn't it? It's like you put it on. It's like yes. yeah, and it yeah. just because you know it's, it's going to pull tight to the wall. It can't. Yeah, it's just it's yeah. So, none of that kind of nice tipping thing. tipping forward right. because that's another thing that you must always think about when you're putting on the D rings is like you don't want them too low. You want them quite high, otherwise yeah. you're going to get the tip, and that yeah. changes the dynamic. This, this is nice. Uh, I, I don't have a piece of this frame, but this is bespoke moulding that I made for my Alu Daibon paintings. So I cut, I cut it on a spindle lathe, um, and, and that, so there's a little cushion, and I glue the panel onto the onto the frame, and then finish oh, it in the same way. Take that, the back. That's and, so satisfying. Yeah, oh, it's really nice, but it's really nice to have my own moulding. 
you know, that's, that's, that's as cool as it gets. And that's coming out. That's, that's, <laughs> the Fenomen Geek is coming out now. <laughs> but you're saying about the aluminium panel, and we were talking about this the other day because um, when we were talking to Annie, she was saying she'd bought a piece off Simone where she'd used aluminium. And aluminium is an amazing medium. And is it, how does that work with the paint being applied onto the aluminium um, um, Well, I use aloe dye bond and aluminium. So aluminium sheet's very heavy. And that has to have a metal primer on it. You can't paint directly onto aluminium um, because it will oxidise and, and you get a, a white sort of build-up. I, I guess it would reject the paint sooner or later. Um, Alu dye bond is a slightly different beast because it's it's aluminium foil on a PVC core, uh, so it's very very lightweight, and you can get surfaces that are ready for digital printing. So they're already primed. They've got a spray coated primer on for photographic printing. Um, and because it's a laminate panel, it, it doesn't sag. Whereas if you were to print a large photograph onto paper, the paper would sag. So uh, that's, that's yeah, there's all sorts of very clever surfaces ready for, uh, for painting and printing. But I've taken out a dye bond sheet, which is already primed, and I, I key it with a, a, a fine sandpaper. And then you apply an image onto that or you apply paint onto that? Paint. You so generally liquid. Yeah. liquid paint and i'm using screen printing squeegees for the al aluminium work um not not necessarily these um perspex squeegees but but sort of drawing color in a more print making way um does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely i think everyone's so intrigued by the process i think they really you know how does that because you're using so many different you've got the ply and then you've got the canvas and then you've got the alu dye bond you know and they're all kind I'm, of creating I'm, a different outcome yes, aren't they? i think well the, the surface every surface affects everything that, that's built on top of it mm. and what i want uh, i don't want to have a painting that's shown the the, the brush marks on the ground for instance mm. i want the painting to be the composition and the thing to be built out of paint you know that, yeah. that for me is very important mm -hmm. but um if you work on that on something that's super smooth or a, like a scottish linen it will give you a very different painting and i like that um i don't want to become bored with one thing so i like no. to mix it up yeah. so um, the last question we have is okay. actually for tracy and Tracy, this is the question. I've just pasted it into the sidebar there. And I have tried to get Tracy back up on screen, but I think, as I say, her tethering is just not strong enough. Sure. So Tracy's work has a recurring motives and influence, it seems, such as Greek folk art, animals, lovers, strong female characters. How consciously does she repeat these, or do they flow naturally and unconsciously? Tracy, it'd be really helpful if you could write your reply in the comments at the side so that um, we can have a conversation about that if you're still with us. I think you're still there. I have tried to get you back up on screen, but um, I think just your uh, your Wi-Fi signal is just not strong enough to keep you with us today, which is a shame because I absolutely love that segment. And um, that's been, I mean, honestly, Richard, thank you so much. You shared so much with us. I, I, I mean, how long ago was it I first showed your work? It's got to be like five, six years ago. So. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of it. Yeah. 2014, was it? Yeah, that's six, six-ish years ago. And you were doing the Alu Dye Bond work and I absolutely loved it. And you've, mm. you've, it has evolved so much since then. And, it, and I, you know... There's going to be a Richard Hayes in my house very soon. We were trying, I was trying to come to the studio, wasn't I? You I was know, yeah, you nearly did. And I then nearly you got, got there, and then I got ill. Yeah. And I got ill, and I think I maybe had the dreaded COVID, because it was right at that time, wasn't it? Like at the beginning of February, and I'd been in yeah. London a lot, and I got ill, and I couldn't come, and then obviously lockdown happened. So, no, now I know you've got 60-odd pieces. <laughs> I'll be able to come over to the studio, hopefully, sometime soon. And, You're very uh, welcome. Anytime. And move on yeah. and actually buy my Richard Hayes now, because um, I definitely – it was there just before, and, uh, yeah, lockdown came and stopped me, and illness came and stopped me um, being able to come over and choose a piece. I was thinking, am I going to choose a piece, or am I going to, like – um, commission you to but actually I think if you've got 60 pieces I 
I know I'm fussy, but I'm sure I'll be able to find one. Pure, oh. It's pure studio yeah. visit it is. Yes, we'll all come. I think so <laughs> interesting that we all come to your studio before you start teaching again. I think we're only allowed to come in sixes. And we've got a couple more questions, so let's see what the other questions are. So um, I'm hoping that um, for Ruth, I'm hoping that Tracy might reappear and answer that one for you. And then we have one from Annie for Richard saying um do you use glazes richard yes you do and how does that work <laughs> <laughs> well um how do i answer that um and then all of a sudden we get a yes <laughs> um yeah so i think if if we can um yes we can see if that, you yes. see that so I could say that that has it beneath that um, pale fallow green. Um, you can see that when the fallow green mi mixes with the, uh, I think it was an Indian yellow with, with uh, a medium added to it, you get this other green moving through. So that would be a way of using a, a glaze. But I'd say that's a very, that's a very clumsy way to use it. Um, but when you have a painting often, um, the larger the painting, the more, um, I'm going to say, the more, maybe the more uh, uh, complicated and, and broken up the surface is, especially working in, a, in, this, in this very robust way with squeegees. So there's quite a lot of glazing that's gone on in various parts of this painting just to calm things down a little bit. Um, so that's working with a small brush and actually, you know, adding, adding a certain, certain um, so maybe, sorry, if this is maybe up here, for instance, this was possibly blazing to, to deepen that sort of warm uh, earth tone. And I also think that over here, um, there's also um, blazing, because this is working on the open canvas and the open canvas is flooded with acrylic. Um, and the open canvas gives this wonderful sort of soft velvetiness that you can't get once you, once you use a prime surface. This is a prime surface and it's much more slick and shiny. So using the open canvas and flooding the colour, you then have to use, you know, in a very select way, glazing to uh, calm things down and, and try and create more of a harmonious whole. Um, I was different a, I was amused by that because it's like that thing where people try and do where they're balancing the Eiffel Tower off the top of their fingers. Here's <laughs> yes. my Indian yellow world. Yes. <laughs> that amused me, sorry. <laughs> Simple girl I am. <laughs> so carry on, sorry. <laughs> but that's all right. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I, I can, you can, you can, I use all sorts of different things, really, mm. different techniques. But that's how you use glazes. So hopefully that's answered that question I hope so. for um, Annie. Um, that's been absolutely brilliant. I'm hoping that Tracy will come back and answer our question. But um, what we'll do is we'll get the answer to that. I'll even email it to her if I have to. And I'll pop it up on social media so everyone will be able to have the answer to that. Um, because right. I'm intrigued. I think my instinct is that they're, they're recurring themes because it was such a significant from listening to her story the greek element of her life as was such a significant um, kind of rebirthing that um you know that's what i picked up from her story that i would expect to see quite a lot of greek um influences in her in her work but let's let's wait for um tracy to answer that for us and if she doesn't answer it on here and you'll always be able to come back and see this crowdcast and see the answers because it'll be on here forever tomorrow we'll go on to number six but today's one will always be there and you'll always be able to go back and see the answers etc to any of the questions i see someone sneakily popped another question in there um hang on a minute so this is sophie sophie you should know better which acrylic does richard use <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> um, that's that's a difficult question because I use a lot. I, I use um, golden acrylics quite a lot because they've got. I think now they've got five different formulations of acrylic, so they've got um, traditional heavy body, they've got uh, open, uh, a fluid, and a high a higher liquid one. Um, so uh, open acrylics take hours and hours to dry. 
they're the, they're the paints that Hockney used for his series of, of you know, portraits he made. Um, so they're quite like oil, but they don't have the same viscosity and body as oil. But the wonderful thing about them is that you can, you can they're very, very sensitive to water. So you can create layers of, of open colour and then lift out miraculously with water. I find them fabulous. Um, I also use Windsor & Newton Professional Colours and good old Liquitex. Um, Golden have a, 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 a fabulous range of mediums that I also use and draw from a lot. Yeah. That was actually Nick Rowland asking that question. So be very kindly popped, it. <laughs> popped it into the ask a question. She's like, that was Nick. <laughs> I thought it was Sophie. Oh, Sophie. Yeah, Sophie, yes. Sophie, popped, yeah, Sophie popped the question in on behalf of Nick because it was on. Oh, I see, I see. I'm with you, of course, of course. Of course. On, uh, Facebook. So uh, we did. I I can't see the questions because I can see it happening, but I can't actually. I'm good, but I'm not that good. I'm listening <laughs> deadly to you. I'm trying to manage, you know, all of this. So no, my right hand woman is there. Uh, because my my left hand woman, obviously Molly, is still very unwell. We're hoping she's going to be back in time to do the Angela interview on Monday, but we'll see. Spoke to her last night. She's feeling a lot better. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how she goes. So thank you. That was great answering um, that question. And um, Annie is saying, where will I find your workshops advertised, Richard? Uh, well, when they're, they're coming back on, um, Emerson College has been closed where my large studio is. And I am starting a Friday morning painting class next week. Uh, and then I will I will have some courses on my new website. Okay, and if with Emerson College, can they do they advertise your workshops as well? Yes, I am I am a, a partner teacher, so I'll I'll be on the website. Um, my studio, because of the COVID protocols, I can have four students um, and only four students in space, uh, which changes things quite a lot. But yeah, that's 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 how it is. So you know that the, you'll be coming to a safe place. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're all like that, aren't we? We're all thinking about how yeah. to make this safe, but to, to make it happen in some in some way. So that's brilliant. So Emerson College are on your new website that is going to be launching in about a week and a half. A week, a week and a half, yeah. And also, obviously, you know, anything that anyone wants to promote, you know, any of the Art360 artists, if you've got something particular to promote, just, you know, email us because we'll pop it up on our social media and we'll put it in stories and we'll put it on Facebook because we get a massive engagement on Facebook. And we're doing really well on Instagram as well. And that's absolutely brand new to us. We literally kind of like started doing Instagram at the beginning of lockdown. And we're doing, yeah, we do, I'm proud of us for Instagram because <laughs> it wasn't our thing. And uh, But Facebook, we're getting massive engagement. And so, yeah, do any of the Art360 artists who are watching this, if you've got information on workshops or anything that you want us to promote for you, just, yeah, drop us an email and we'll we'll promote it onto the, the Facebook and Instagram and put it on stories etc so thank you richard it's been absolutely brilliant i am thank you. I know so much more and i will be over to pick up right. richard. now i yeah. obviously i'm completely well <laughs> i'll be taking my temperature to make sure i'm not um contagious but i'm on that program now where they take my they do the test every week or whatever to see whether i'm whether i have the virus so um i know that i'm okay uh Good. So thank you so much. And thank you, Tracy, for sharing. That was just an amazing story. Absolutely yeah, incredible. Awesome. I was really interested. And thank you for showing resilience, Tracy, because your sound was, was and, and everyone for carrying on watching, because the sound was a little bit tricky. But, you know, we just have to kind of power through it, don't we? The story was, was so powerful. We just power through it and just listen intent, a bit more intently. So thank you, both of you. Tomorrow, it's Dr. Leonie Morris. There is an energy doctor. So I'm really intrigued to hear all about this and how that works and very much how we can bring that into our creative world to help us thrive and be more successful and achieve the aspirations that we have. So, yeah, see you all here tomorrow, 5.30, with myself and Dr. Leonie Morris. And thank you again to the wonderful guests today, um, Richard Hayes and to Trace, Tracy Peasley. And yeah, take a look at their websites and their pages and contact them. And yeah, you'll definitely be able to um, go and do some um, lessons with Richard very soon. Coming soon. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye.